Hi guys, can you hear me okay? I can boom my voice that way, you should be able to capture me over the music. Um, I've got a very short period of time here, so I'm not going to tell too much of a story. I'm just going to give you a little bit of context about me and who I am. And then I'd really love to open the floor. If you've got questions, I'd, I'd prefer to use the short amount of time we have to answer them for you so that you get the most value. Um, but who am I? Um, I'm an entrepreneur first and a CEO second. Um, right now I'm the managing director and group CEO of a company called Vroom Vroom Vroom. .com.au. We're a global car rental comparison website. We've been in business 16 years and I've been involved the last six. So now I'm a, a co-owner of the business um, and we are effectively an Expedia or a Webjet of the car rental world. Our biggest partners are Hertz, Avis, Budget, Thrifty, Europe Car and we book about a thousand cars every single day for those partners all over the world. So we're number one in Australia and New Zealand and we, we still book in the Northern Hemisphere as well, a good, good amount of business. We do about $80 million a year. So before Vroom, and to give you a little bit of an idea as to sort of, you know, the context for today's discussion around digital and social, um, I've always been an entrepreneur since I could remember. You know, my, my entrepreneurial career started at about age 11 selling lost golf balls. And I went on to start and, and fail at many businesses throughout high school and university. And where I really cut my teeth on digital was you know, when I, was, when I was studying here up the river at UQ, I started a party hire business when I was 17, 18. And it was out of sheer frustration that I couldn't hire a beer keg for my 18th birthday. All right? And so I, I couldn't believe that there wasn't a, a market for that because I, I had demand but there was no supply. So I set about building a business called Cooley Bar, um, which we ended up running for about three years. And, and so, um, you know, I won't tell you the whole story, but you know, I borrowed five grand from mum and dad, imported some gear from the US, the dispensing equipment and the gas and all that sort of stuff in order to, to chill beer kegs and, and allow you to have a, a party, you know, US college style for an 18th or 21st. Um, we then expanded into daiquiri machines and, and other things. But, you know, what was really interesting about that party hire company was that we never spent a cent on advertising and yet we ran it very successfully for three years and made quite a bit of cash. It was an amazing sort of hobby semi-pro business while I was, you know, at, in uni. I was only working the weekends. We'd take inquiries during the week and, and make money on Saturday and Sunday with deliveries of equipment. Um, so we ended up marketing the entire thing using digital channels. And it was at the very early stages of social media where most people didn't know what, what Facebook or Twitter was or they thought it was child's play. But for me, it was perfect at the time because my entire demographic, my entire target market were 18 and 20 and 21 year olds and they were the only ones on the platforms. They were the early adopters. So I went where, where my customers were. And rather than paying to advertise, in fact, Facebook didn't even have an ad platform back then, neither did Twitter. All we did was actually promote what we were already doing. So we would ask, you know, we, we'd get a, a party, we'd have an 18th or 21st, we would ask if we could come in and photograph the party on behalf of the, of the celebrant and we'd give them the photos for free. But what we'd do, of course, is put Cooley Bar um, tag in the, in the bottom right-hand corner of the, of the photo as a watermark, and all of their friends were tagged in the image and shared all over Facebook. And so our branding was being spread organically all over, and anybody that thought, oh, wow, that's really cool to have a keg or a daiquiri machine or something that's lots of fun, our brand just spread purely on word of mouth. And then we leveraged you know, um, ranking in Google for SEO purposes and all of that sort of thing and really learned quite a bit just through trial and error and lots of error. So, you know, that led me into the next business where I ended up doing digital marketing consulting for some much bigger brands um, because the story got out that we were running a fairly successful business without spending a cent on advertising. And so I quickly became a consultant and at the age of 20, I was charging $350 an hour and being flown all over the country into boardrooms and meet, meeting with marketing teams of publicly listed companies, trying to educate them on this whole social media marketing thing that they'd started to hear about but had no idea how to make money out of. Um, so, you know, that one thing led to another, to another, to another, and there's plenty of stories I can tell you about ventures. But why we're here today is, is really to talk about how at Vroom Vroom Vroom, we run a globally distributed remote workforce, how we attract them, how we retain them, how we engage them, and the sorts of shifts we're seeing in the workforce now and in the future. And I, I think it's, it's relevant because we're an early adopter of technology and what we're doing now, you're going to see become mainstream in two, three, four, five years. So 
Uh, we, ha we have um, a presence in 12 countries, uh, employees in 12 countries, but we only have two physical offices. Right, so that means that I've got employees in 10 other countries that are either working from home or working from co-working spaces, uh, freelancing or contracting or working across countless time zones we can't keep up. So how do we do that? Why do we do that? What's the benefit? What's the value? For me, the biggest value is we're actually playing with a global talent pool. You know, in this day and age, particularly for some digital um, roles, it's extremely hard to find the talent because all of a sudden everyone's a digital company, all of a sudden you know, everybody needs software developers or digital marketers or, or the sorts of talent that we've been using for years. You know, not only has the price doubled, um, but they're much, much harder to find and attract. So opening ourselves up to a global workforce allows us to not only fill roles, but find better talent for the same money and, and fill the roles faster. So we do that in a number of different ways. We, our head office is based here in Brisbane and we engage people like anyone else. We have you know, full-time salaried employees. We also have, you know, we're, we're a digital business. We don't see a lot of our customers. So we have some flexibility for uh, whether it be mums that need to make the school pick up and they need to work some odd hours. We accommodate that sort of thing to attract talent. It's not all about money, it's about flexibility. Um, Globally, we, we employ people directly as contractors, but we also use tools like Upwork, uh, which was previously called Odesk or Freelancer, you know, any of these networks to find and engage the right talent. And, you know, I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. Uh, I guess what we've done in order to be successful is we've persisted. We've chosen that we wanted to double down on this, on this remote team and make it work. Um, and we've had our our highs and our lows with it. But I think over the last couple of years, we've really built a lot of IP around what we do and making that successful. Um, and we now use a lot of systems, processes and tools internally to drive up the communication and make sure that we're still getting all the no knowledge sharing, even though we're not sitting next to each other and you know walking by the, the water cooler, as they say. So um, I'll share a couple of those quick tactics with you and then I'm going to open it up to the floor so that you guys can sort of pull out the knowledge that you want. Um, one of the things that we started last year that's been really successful and it started as an experiment is something that we call a CEO AMA, which stands for a CEO Ask Me Anything session. You guys might be familiar with AMAs on the internet through sites like Reddit. Um, I sort of took that concept, evolved it and brought, brought it privately into our business. The way it works is last year we ran them about once a quarter. This year we're, they were so successful we're probably going to move it to monthly. Um, but effectively I sit down in front of a, a webcam or a laptop. I live stream straight to YouTube using their free live streaming tech. Um, I think you can do, do it with Google Hangouts and a bunch of other different things. But the reason I use YouTube is because I can broadcast live and it will or automatically save the video for later as well. I unlist the video so it's a private link. You can only view it if I give you the link and I share that link internally with my team. We've got about 60 people around the world. So we host an AMA, we schedule it three o'clock in the afternoon, one afternoon. Um, it goes for about an hour. And in the few hours prior to that, my team collect a list of anonymous questions from, from uh, our team all over the world. So I end up usually with about 60 or 70 questions from the team, which could range from you know, interesting questions like, can we all have a pay rise or a free massage chair? Or, you know, what's coming up in the business? What are the big challenges at the moment? What, you know, what are you tackling at CEO level? What should we be aware of? You know, who, what are the roles we're hiring for next? What's the risks in our industry? The sorts of stuff that, you know, people are curious about, but they're not necessarily have access to ask a CEO. So the whole purpose is to drive massive transparency tear down any, any barriers to that, any walls, any silos, um, and we're really big on basically being the anti-bureaucracy. So I, I then sit there for an hour, where I have one of the team read out the questions to me, and in most cases I've never even seen them before, so I have to act right there on the spot, and I broadcast live. We usually have about 50% of the team in, a, in the right sort of a time zone that tune in and watch it for an hour and the other 50% watch it in their time zone on YouTube later when they wake up. It's something that we have received rave reviews on. Um, they've really got a lot of value out of it. They've been extremely grateful for the level of transparency and just the fact that we even want to run that internally 
really helps us retain talent because it shows we care. The other thing that we're doing similar to that is, you know, you'll see Claire and, and Jorg here. Um, you know, they're here with me. They're filming me today. This, this little talk will be on YouTube and I'm going to share that out on the, on the social channels. And only three weeks ago, I started producing a daily video blog sharing day in the life of a CEO, day in the life of an entrepreneur. And I've put out you know, five or six episodes now of uh, us traveling through Manila and what our Manila office looks like, transiting through Hong Kong, the Brisbane office, and, and how we're doing some of this because people are curious and that's actually part of how we attract talent. So when people are Googling me or Googling vroom vroom vroom, we're putting out a huge amount of social content now. And that part of that is driving self-selection. We want people to see what our brand is doing, decide whether or not that's a great fit for them, and choose to opt in or opt out when we're advertising a role. Or, or better yet, knock on the door and say, I love what you're doing, are there any roles going? All right, so um, I could talk for hours, but I'll try and slow it all down there. Hopefully that gives you a few seeds in your mind. Are there any immediate questions that I can answer for you? Yeah. Um, for your people who are globally dispersed, kind of all around the world, yep. how do you engage them in a company culture if they're kind of, yeah, They're out on their own, yeah. So the question was for the remote team that are dispersed all over the world, how do we engage them in the company culture? Um, so we use all sorts of communication and collaboration tools. Our favorite is Slack. I'm sure you guys have heard of Slack and used internally. So we basically banned internal email because we found that the the response rate and the level of communication was far too slow and people felt out of the loop with time zones. So we moved to a chat-based collaboration tool, which was Slack, um, and that really reduces the divide. Um, each of the teams, whether it's development or marketing uh, or design, has a daily stand-up. And that's, so it's a, that's a daily video call where they stand up and just do a really quick check-in. This is what's on my list today. This is what I'm doing. This is what went well yesterday. And they do that within their teams so that they're actually getting face time and feeling like they're part of something. Um, the CEO AMA helps bridge the gap for everybody and give them access to me. I, I catch about 100 flights a year. I'm around the world quite a bit. And so I can film that anywhere rather than having to be in just one of those offices. Um, and of course, you know, we try and make sure that everyone, irrespective of where they are, are onboarded correctly and trained in our core values, our operating principles, what we're all about, and everybody participates in the ideas, the planning, the strategy, and what's next. And that's, again, it sort of comes into our core value of being an ad hocracy rather than a bureaucracy, and really making sure everyone feels part of what we call the Vroom family. Yeah, yeah. Look, to be honest, you, you know, like the CEO AMA was, if I use that as an example, was my idea, but it was really just a variation on a public AMA I'd seen. You know, if you guys aren't familiar with it, they get famous people to answer public questions on a forum called Reddit. And I just thought, I'm going to do that on video and I'm going to do it internally for the team to share knowledge. Um, in terms of new platforms and what to use and why would you use them in a social environment, for me, I just experiment, you know. Um, I, I pay attention to the market, I see what other people are doing and I try and model their behavior or, you know, and I'm not prepared, to, I'm not worried about falling on my face. You know, I'm an entrepreneur first, a CEO second, so I'm pretty used to failure. You know, we, we're, we're prepared to have a go at things. So, you know, last year about February or March, I saw some very early adopters in the business world starting to use Snapchat. So I downloaded it thinking it was either a, a tool used for things that we don't talk about or a tool used for teenagers. But all of a sudden I saw some really clever people using it and I thought, hey, there's got to be a reason why. So I just downloaded the app and started playing with it. And the first few times I put out content and I think I accidentally sent it to myself, you know, it didn't even work. But you just try. And so then very quickly around June, July last year, I started doing um, full length snap stories and that's where you know, they're 10 second videos at a time, but I would hold out my phone like this and I would record a video talking to camera as I'm walking down the street or as I'm going into a meeting. I just started sharing my day because I realized that 
I'm a, a young CEO running a fairly big global business, and that's a unique position that a lot of people are interested in. So rather than trying to be really, really creative and really produced to put out content, I just started sharing what I'm already doing. And I think that for a lot of people, you can do that as well. I think there's a lot to be said for documenting what you already do rather than creating, because otherwise you spend a lot of time you know, planning, producing, worrying about lighting and sound and all that sort of thing. Allow it to be terrible in the first place. Just make a plan to put out 10 videos or make a plan to write 10 blog posts or, or 10 tweets or whatever it is that you want to experiment with. And don't worry if no one looks or responds or shares. That's not the point. You know, the only way I got camera comfortable was by doing it. And I wasn't at all comfortable in the beginning and I felt like a fool and I wanted to delete it afterwards. It was only this year I really picked up Instagram for exactly the same thing, Instagram stories. Uh, so now I'm doing it on a bit of Snap and a bit of Instagram and it's opened up a completely different audience for me. So I was doing that before I walked in here today. I, I took a little bit of the story before I walked up. I captured a little bit of Petra speaking. I'm just trying to document the day uh, of what goes on in my life because people are curious and then they end up finding out about vroom 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 and they become aware of it and next time they think of renting a car they go oh that's right I sort of saw that guy and maybe I'll google that. You know it's it's not about direct selling in the social environment if you're trying to promote your business or if you're trying to attract talent. It's not about push 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 it's about add as much value as you possibly can hopefully with interesting content and allow people to opt in themselves. You're trying to promote word of mouth rather than selling something. I'm not sure I've got the question properly. One more time. I'm wondering how you link it to your recruitment, because obviously when you're putting yourself out there, you're selling the business and people think you yes. go and buy a car. Yes. So how do you link that to recruitment? Oh, okay. So, you know, I'll just come back over here so everyone can hear me, but um, how do we link the content that we're putting out that's primarily promoting the business or promoting me to recruitment? How do we actually make the ask for recruitment and attract talent? I actually think, you know, a lot of that is is almost by osmosis. The same people that are consuming the content for business kind of wish their business was like that. You know, that's what we're going for. We're trying to actually be a little bit contrarian and have, have a more interesting culture or more interesting content or a slightly more flexible workforce to attract talent. And, and we can compete with big corporates because we have an entrepreneurial culture. You know, we can attract people that, that need to have a flexible workforce. We work with freelancers all the time. We work with people that, that have us work from home a couple of days a week and then work from the office a couple of days a week. We've built systems to make that happen. And I think that, to some extent, is our competitive advantage. So if we're putting out content like this and, and people are following along because they find that interesting, I'll just pull out an Instagram story one day and I'll hold up my phone and they'll say, hey guys, we've actually just published three new roles or we're thinking about publishing three new roles. We need a digital producer, we need a videographer because we started doing all of this content and you can see that the videos aren't great. We want them to be great. If you know anyone that would love to play along with this journey, let me know. You know, so we can still go down traditional recruitment channels. What we're trying to do is value add to the process. So one, you know, if our network's big enough or our audience is big enough on social, we might directly attract some talent, which is great. You know, that shortcuts the process. They're already familiar with us because they've consumed some content. But what's more likely to happen is we'll publish a role or we'll give a role to a recruitment firm. And as they start shopping it around and people are shortlisted or candidates start to become interested, there is no candidate in the world these days that doesn't Google the business and potentially the leadership of the business before deciding if they want to put their hand up for it or go for an interview, right? And that's where they find our content. So I'm putting out content irrespective of whether or not anyone's watching now because it's all on Google, right? Or it's all on Instagram, it's all, it's all on Facebook, it's all still there. And so someone can find it when they're ready and when it's relevant. And you know, we will actually put out content under the Vroom brand about our culture, about our values. We'll show what the office looks like you know, and what the vibe's like internally. We'll share some stuff from office celebrations and birthdays and, you know, a couple of weeks ago we had a great party because the business turned 16. So we had a 16th birthday cake and we had a bit of fun in the two offices around the world and we sent some stuff to the remote team to engage them as well. I think it's about being you and being your organisation and just sharing that a little bit more publicly and that helps the recruitment process.
you know, our business is really interesting. A lot of people think, you know, we're run by 20 year olds. Um, there's a bit of that, you know, particularly in the, and because I'm young, right? <laughs> um, we've got a lot of young software developers and digital marketers in that because it's, it's, it's a newer space. But we actually balance out to an average age of about 45. You know, I, I often make a joke. We, uh, we, we actually appear to attract a demographic of um, mums with children that have left home and they're in their early 50s that basically run the ship and then the group of young guys and girls that are doing marketing and digital. It's just a weird mix of what we've managed to attract. In terms of the content though, um, completely different on different social networks. So, you know, when we put videos out on YouTube, they're consumed by all sorts of different demographics and age groups. Um, Instagram is really aging up. You know, so it started young, Facebook started young, now grandma's on Facebook looking at the, pa the pictures, right? Or mum and dad are on Facebook looking at the pictures. So there's plenty of people on Facebook and they'll consume more content than you think. They might not be as digital savvy and commenting and liking and sharing on everything, but there's a lot of views there. Um, you know, Twitter's an interesting space at the moment. Um, it's in decline, but apparently there's an, a, a new emerging group of people adopting it in the teens. So, you know, we're watching that. Snapchat at the moment for me, because I mainly put out entrepreneur and business content, I don't get much engagement because it's too young. I get a few other people that are trying to do what I do, but we consume each other's content, but we're not really reaching a wider audience. When I took exactly the same snap story, you know, daily videos that maybe add up to five or 10 minutes throughout the day and put that on an Instagram story sharing day in the life, it exploded like 600 times the amount of engagement on Snapchat. That's not to, to mean that I'll stop with Snapchat, it just means it's not ready yet, it's not mature enough. Instagram has much better discoverability because I can put a hashtag on it that says CEO or entrepreneur or day in the life and people discover my content. On Snapchat, people only watch me if they already follow me. And so it's a much higher barrier to entry. So you know, I don't have all the answers, I just experiment, to be honest. Yeah, look, massively, massive difference in, in the different markets around the world. In Brisbane, we're seeing a, a much bigger agitation for flexible workforce. You know, they're getting the ideas or they're, they're looking at it from, you know, Europe and the US is so far ahead of us in terms of this sort of stuff. Australia is a bit slower in terms of the adoption, but these digital first businesses like ours are the ones to adopt it first. Um, so, you know, we've got a lot of uh, flexible workforce in Brisbane and they're, they're our most senior staff. Most of my management team are based in the head office in Brisbane. Um, in Manila, much more regimented and um, process and systems driven. So that's where the majority of people that we have in a Manila office, we've got about 25 people there at the moment. And I'm not talking call center, I'm talking SEO, design, software development, um, strategy. We have CPA accountants there, all sorts. Um, a lot of those actually thrive in a, in a much more structured environment because that's what they're used to. And so when we started actually offering flexibility in the Philippines, it failed miserably for us. Unless someone's set up from home as a 100% full-time freelancer and they never come to the office, the whole hybrid flexibility thing is not something that their culture is used to or, or, or mature enough, I think, to, to handle. Um, and then there's real infrastructure challenges, right? So if you're working in a place like the Philippines, we're in our office because we have a fiber internet connection. They don't have the same infrastructure at home, which is why they travel in. And traffic and transport and all those sorts of things around the city are an issue. So we recruit in a very tight circle around our core infrastructure. That's what the money's all on. It's on the office with the great internet and the backup power and all of that. And then people come into that hub. Whereas in Brisbane, People can work from home. They can, you know, we've got remote workforce in Sydney. We've got remote workforce in New Zealand. We've got remote workforce in Spain and the US. In the more mature countries, we can rely on the infrastructure, which is so important to our business. In the freelancing world, so we use Upwork quite a bit to discover contractors that are purely freelance. Sometimes they stay on Upwork for years and we pay the fees and use the Upwork platform. Other times they become full-time employees and we contract them directly and pull them off the platform. Um, but every market's slightly different. The thing we found the most success with is 
the really high caliber freelancers in the world that use Upwork, the really, the really valuable ones. So I'm talking about, you know, if you're trying to attract a software developer, a senior software developer, maybe the market's really tight here in Brisbane, you, you haven't quite found the right person, but you find them in, what's a good example, Bali. I hired someone in Bali last year. Um, still a six figure spend, right? This is still a role that's probably $110,000 Aussie equivalent, but I've found the most success with those types of roles for the really talented are the craving reliability, ongoing, stable work. Because the main reason they operate on those platforms is, is two reasons. One, they want flexibility of hours and work or interesting work. Two, more likely they live in a place where there's not enough work and they want to play in the global workforce. So I've, you know, we have people from from Russia and India and Bangladesh and Bali and Lithuania and Spain and the US and all over. And they have these great talents that we have in demand. They don't have the same opportunity in their local economy. And so we've had great success engaging people on short-term trials and then offering them a full-time, long-term contract. Even if it's still through the Upwork contract, we'll give them a guarantee of a year's work or six months work. Because you usually find that, that these are guys and girls that have worked in corporate, been agitated by it, haven't enjoyed it, they've come out and decided to freelance, then they've realized that freelancing's hard, right? You have four clients on the go, a client says, yeah, we need you next week, but then they shift their project and so you were counting on the cash flow, but then it wasn't available because you're at the mercy of other people. So usually these are technicians, software devs or designers, they're not good at running a business, they're not good at client management, they're not good at managing time and energy. So. They go out for the opportunity to work from home and the flexibility, but when we offer them a full-time gig with ongoing work and they don't have to worry about juggling multiple clients and multiple projects, we often get a big sigh of relief and we attract much greater talent and we retain them longer. So really flexible in our Western markets like Brisbane and the US and the UK, um, very regimented in in the Philippines and other parts of Asia, and then you know Eastern Europe and other freelancers like a bit of flexibility, but they like guaranteed work because these people still have mortgages and bills to pay. Just conscious of everyone's time, so I'm going to Yeah, I, I think that, that last story I just told about professional freelancers that you're giving full time or very sort of uh, guaranteed work to is where we're going. You know, that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing people that demand that they want freedom of geography. They want to be out like, I, we have a, an optimization manager, a quite senior role who does all of our conversion optimization, analytics and testing and split testing and all that sort of stuff. Brilliant guy based in Lithuania. I was chatting to him, you know, a month ago and it looked different, you know, we're video conferencing his different room and I said, oh, it looks sunny today. And he said, yeah, I moved to Spain. I didn't even know, right? He said, I moved to Spain for three months for the summer, or for the winter because it's too cold in Lithuania, you know? And so he loves that freedom and flexibility. He still delivers all his work. He's got a commitment to us, but, but he can move around. So I'm seeing more of that being pushed even into the Western environments here in Australia. Um, the US and Europe. I think people want to be able to make commitments for mortgages and bills and plan their life and grow their family and have security, but they just need a little, a little bit more flexibility in terms of where they are and when they work. So not everybody can offer that, even to some extent we can't, right? We have a, a very large customer care team that answer phone calls and they can't choose when they work. They're very much rostered on to make sure we've got full coverage. Um, but where you have the roles and you can provide flexibility, I think you're going to see a much bigger demand for that coming up. Any other questions? Thanks so much. Thank you, guys. I hope it was valuable. Thank you.